The views expressed on this show by guests and the host on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is 9-11 Freefall, and I am the host, Andy Steele, and I am honored tonight to be joined by Dr. Leroy Halsey. If you're not aware, and if you haven't been following the 9-11 uh, Truth Movement and AE 9-11 Truth very closely over the last couple of years, uh, he is behind the University of Alaska report, but let me formally introduce him tonight. Uh, Dr. Leroy Halsey is a professor emeritus at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where he taught structural engineering. We're going to have to ask him how many years that was when he comes on. Uh, before coming to the university, he owned and ran three high-tech engineering research corporations, and he also taught at the University of Missouri Rolla and North Carolina State University. And as this audience knows, as I just said, he authored the study. It's called A Structural Reevaluation of the Collapse of World Trade Center Seven. That is a mouthful, but a lot of revealing and important information in that report. I looked into Building 7 and NIST claims uh, regarding that building's fall on September 11th. But you know what? I didn't write it. He did. We're going to let him tell you all about it. So let's go ahead and add him in here. Dr. Halsey, welcome back to 9-11 Free Fall. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, I hope everybody's having a great day. They are going to be, and we're going to be talking about your presentation on Friday, but also just before we get going, how many years was that that you were teaching at the University of Alaska Fairbanks? I came there in 1987 in January, and so I spent 35 years before I, I stepped away. And on the January on June 30th, 2020 was the day that I decided to, to retire. All right. Well, awesome. Well, you, I, I call you semi-retired because you're doing important work right now. I don't think you're getting paid for it or anything, but the message that you're bringing, the information that you're bringing is so critical, such a game changer for all the people who have cared about this issue for so long. Uh, and as I mentioned, you've got a busy week coming up. You're doing this show today, but on Friday, you're going to be presenting at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, tell our audience all about that and what you're going to be bringing to the people there. So, so what I have in mind is that uh, I'm going to I have a I have a presentation that I've given to structural engineers around the country, and uh, a time or two. And so, at this point, I'm going to bring that to the table and share it with the hopefully the faculty, the students, and the practicing engineers and architects in the community. And so I, I hope and I, I pray that that uh, is going to happen. I, I understand that people can be there live and they can also be there virtually if they want to be. And so that gives people the opportunity to, if they have another conf a potential conflict or they have um, places they have to be right before the presentation begins, they can, they can participate. And so, that's what I'm hoping is going to happen. So the idea is to convey what I found and why it's important for the community and and the practicing professionals, why this needs to be aired to the public. Absolutely. Now, I want to let our audience know we're going to be doing our part here at AE 9-11 Truth. We're going to be sending out a bulletin that has the relevant links so that you can tune in live or you can watch it in the archives. As Dr. Halsey said, you might have work or something else going on, but you can definitely check this out. So you need to be subscribed to our emails to do that. If you're not subscribed to our emails, do so. That's how we keep you informed because for some reason, the corporate media doesn't seem to want to help us out any. So we got to do the work ourselves and bring it right to your inbox. Um, but keep an eye out for that. That'll be going out, I believe, on Thursday or Friday morning at the latest. What time is that going to be in Alaska time? So Alaska time that uh, when it's my understanding that my presentation in Alaska is going to go on at 1130 a.m. 
I believe, for about an hour. And that that uh, on Eastern time, you are four hours past that. So I'm one hour different than Pacific time. So as an example, on Pacific uh, time in Seattle or someplace like that, that would be 1230. And, and All right. just, well, we just move forward to Eastern time would be four hours from that, which I think would be 1130. PM. All right. Well, we're going to, yeah, we're going to let everybody know with all the relevant stuff once we've gathered all the information, yeah. but it's right off of the University of Alaska's uh, website there. And uh, we've been, I've been sent that link. So definitely make sure you guys save that and remember it and share it around too. Don't just keep the information to yourselves so that you know about it, but send it out to professionals, you know, if they're engineers, if you know engineering professors, other people in the industry, or even just your best friend who uh, has been rolling your, their eyes at you for years talking about this. Let them look at all of the science and know-how that goes into making these kinds of evaluations, coming to these kinds of conclusions. Now, I'm sort of talking over the heads of newbies a little bit. I always try to remember there are people that may have just woken up to this, may be just curious about what this organization, AE911 Truth, is all about and tuning in for the first time. So I know you've probably done this uh, a lot, Dr. Halsey, but I'm just going to ask you to just – Briefly summarize what the University of Alaska Fairbanks' study was all about and go over just some of the basic uh, discoveries you made and conclusions you came to. Okay. So let me begin by saying that uh, I'm not the youngest guy on the block. And so initially I was contacted by a gentleman in Anchorage who it was a member of AE 911 Truth. And uh, he, he's a mechanical engineer, but he also works in the medical profession. And um, he contacted me and said, hey, would you be interested in providing a re research on examining the NIST report? And uh, I turned him down. He contacted me again. He turned, I turned him down. Contacted me again. And I was thinking, OK, uh, I'll put in a proposal, and which I did. And we went ahead and the university accepted it. It's not a research by me. Uh, it was a research by the university and I was the, what's called the principal investigator of that. That's the way that works. The reason I'm bringing that forth, I've heard complaints from time to time saying, oh, he got paid for this. I didn't get paid for that. What I got is my same salary uh, and I was doing the research for a 911 Truth as a research contract with the university. So that, that's an important idea because those that have tried to get rid, <coughs> challenge it from time to time, <coughs> to ha it turns out that they didn't really understand that or they were trying to utilize it to make it look bad. So going forward, what did I do? Uh, I began to look at the NIST report and I made a, and I had two PhD students working for me. Uh, and that's pretty significant because they were doing advanced work and working with me uh, on this particular project. The idea was that I first set up a, a process by which we could have quality control. That means that I want to ensure that this project was going to be based upon science. And I, I told my students, and this is pretty unusual, I said, I don't want you to be reading about it. I want you to be working with me on a daily basis and we will examine what you've got so far. And day by day, I will examine the science and make sure that what we're doing is moving forward scientifically. Don't want any, don't want any information coming in from the press or anybody else that could possibly affect your thinking. We can't afford that. What we're going to do is do this scientifically. Step one, step two. And so every day uh, we would have a meeting in the morning uh, and we would set up what we're going to do the following day after that meeting. But the, that meeting initially was to examine the work that had been done the previous day. And I would then make sure that uh, the work was had been done according to what the, 
the principles that we were looking for, uh, looking at, and make that work. Okay, so through that process, that was to guarantee that there would be no question about what we did scientifically. <clears throat> Excuse me. So through that process, I began to say, okay, what, what, what does, what's this building geometry look like? This is not a normal building in which it was square or rectangular. It was trapezoidal. And so if you were going to look at a failure of that particular building, it's likely not to come down as a straight, straight collapse. What I mean vertically. It, that's the way it failed. It came down. If you look at pictures and videos and all the kinds of things, it came straight down. Okay, so so I begin to look at uh, first thing I said. Okay, I need to find the point of what's called zero movement centroid, the centroid of this a floor system. I also need to look at what's called a thermal point of zero movement. In other words, where is that point at thermally, so that if uh, it begins to expand within the floor system, where is it moving with respect to? And I often say, okay, look, uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, imagine, for example, if I had a frying pan and I had turned on the heat and uh, I was holding it uh, on the handle, which way would the movement occur? Would it be coming away from my hand or would it be going to, to my hand? And it, you, you know that it's going to expand away from your hand. But as soon as you put a clamp on the other end, it's going to move towards your hand so it so you're looking for a point of what what that point is where it's going to expand around this is significant because NIST claimed that it expanded in the floor system and it caused the girder that came into AE9 uh, the uh, uh, column 79 to come off its seat and collapse and cause the, the failure to occur well, it became, uh, so I, I was the, I think that was the keynote speaker, one of the speakers on the 15th anniversary of the collapse. And I was in New York and I was uh, giving a talk. And the first thing I said, and this, this was a few, goodness gracious, I can't imagine. Uh, we hadn't been on this very long at all. And I discovered right away that the building, when it, if it was to expand, it would expand from that point of thermal mo movement about that, which means that that point of zero movement was really, really close to the elevator shafts. So visualize that this building had these elevators and they were near the cin center of the building on floor level, you know, floor line. And so it, it was, that was the stiffest spot within that building. And so it, it began, if it was to expand, if you heated up the floor system and it was to move with respect to that point, which way would it move? Well, it would move towards the east. NIST didn't do that. They said, no, no, that exterior of that building is very, very stiff and it's going to move west. And by moving west, it's it ended up having a problem in uh, moving off of the plate, the support plate that it was sitting on, which was at, uh, at uh, column 79. That's not, that's not what happened and that isn't what could have happened because they made a mistake. All right, so now what, and this surprised everybody at that meeting because they, they'd all been talking about how it moved. Well, it was based upon a false premise. And so all of a sudden things changed because I discovered that that couldn't happen. The other problems that uh, they they identified that I identified is they didn't have they didn't account for what's called sheer sheer. Uh, well, basically, what it is is uh, um, there are steel steel members like bolts that are fastened to the top plate of steel and then the concrete slab is poured over that and in this case uh, they didn't think they had any shear 
studs on that on that floor system. That was not true. The the drawings that we had, and and the, and the uh, I believe the court documents showed that it had shear studs. So and what is that, why is that so important? It's important because the concrete floor system and and the steel beams are carrying the load. But if the shear studs are not there, then one would argue, okay, the concretes can slip over the top of that steel beam and only the steel beams carrying the load. And the concrete's just providing weight. Not true. That's not what tr was ca the case. So the other problem that they, they had is that they uh, didn't realize, or they did, I don't know what, what, what they were thinking, but they, there, was, there were these um, plates that were around the column of 79, which actually stuck out from the flanges. And if it was going to move, it had to move up against that, and, and, and it couldn't. But they didn't use, think about using those plates that were sticking out, preventing any, any movement to slip uh, beyond the width of that base plate. Am I making sense? Is this all? Yeah. I mean, these are the missing structural features that I um, mean we have cited many times. What I'm curious about, and I you know I was looking at the FAQs from NIST, and there was something about the shear studs. I don't remember what they said in it, unfortunately. But uh, from your knowledge, how can they justify that? Now, I mean, on our side of things, and you know, we're sort of the activists. We say, well, they're just, you know, they they, they were trying to. Uh, come come up to a, a predetermined conclusion, and that's why they left them out. But they still have to come up with some good explanation for why they leave it out. Is there any justification for excluding those shear studs? And what does NIST have to, to say about that? Well, you know, as you probably know, uh, AE 911 Truth has um, uh, reported what I what I found. And uh, NIST has not responded to, uh, to my knowledge, they have not responded to any of the questions that we've put forth. And so, so legitimately, that's not the way the NIST organization should be acting because they're there for the purpose of providing specifications and all the kinds of criteria. NIST stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So guess what? They should be we have a, an obligation to design by code to ensure public safety. And if you're not going to understand the system, then you can't have a legitimate code. So at the end of the day, why are we so interested in making sure that the people, the practicing engineers and architects understand what actually should have been put forth as a cause of failure? Yeah, I mean, there is no standard here. There is no standard except for uh, the standard of deceit, deception. Again, I'm editorializing a little bit. I can on my show. But, the, I mean, that's the standard that they set here. And we've done everything that we can. And I'm convinced at this point they're just trying to wait us out, hoping that we just kind of fold up, disappear, and that they can just uh, – withstand all of these challenges in this inquiry and, and stay within this metaphorical brick wall that they've built around this official story. Um, now, again, I'm just a layman. I'm not an engineer. I just play one on TV. That's my joke by hosting this. But no, I'm not an engineer. I, I know a lot about these NIST reports and uh, I've studied this. Uh, and my the essence of what they have said is that the inside of Building 7 came down first, and then the exterior, that's why it looks like it's falling as one unit, uh, but they assure you that that is not what's happening. It's not controlled demolition because the interior falls first. Now, that doesn't make sense on its face. To anybody with just a little bit of common sense, we'd be seeing a lot of warping on the outside. We would definitely see signs of something taking place inside, taking place on the outside, um, because it's not like these buildings are made out of paper mache and can just kind of continue standing there. Now, that is my very basic layman's explanation there, but I'm wondering if you could delve deeper into sort of this phenomenon. Um, 
you know, is this possible for the interior part of a building to just come down without really seeing anything on the outside? And if not, I want to hear your uh, your breakdown of that entire process that NIST is laying out. Well, first of all, let me back up for just a second. Um, NIST made the assumption that the exterior part of the building was incredibly stiff with respect to the interior. False statement. That's the basis by which they said the expansion was east and not west. The movement, I mean, it was west and not east, basically, because it was moving away from the exterior. In other words, coming back to my initial point that if, if, you, if you heat something up, it's going to move with respect to the stiffest point. And so if you uh, imagine that they said it was really, really stiff on the exterior, then everything moves in inward. Which means that the distance from that exterior to that plate that they were saying caused all the problems, the failure of that inside, <clears throat> that's, that was the most movement. About five, they initially said five and a half inches uh, and then they discovered the plate width, and which which was more than they originally started with. So then they came back and added, said, "Oh, we were wrong. It should have been 6.25 inches the amount of movement, if I recall correctly." <coughs> so that that was um, another interesting point that they made after they'd already filed a report. They made a change. Okay, so coming back to your question, uh, which has to do with uh, what, what there were so many issues here, uh, and they didn't answer any of them, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I think they pro I think they had this out to contract to uh, other, uh, other parties to do the, the, the work, and then they reported this in their report. Okay, coming, so coming back. I spent almost a year after I had already come up with all of the things that we knew had to happen, uh, almost a year trying to establish uh, that the inside moved first and the exterior columns went after that and, and, and um, bent inward to cause this issue that you brought up. I spent a year trying to verify that and it could, it was not possible. I even took smaller structures and played that little game. Couldn't make it happen. So then we said, okay, let's let the structure tell us what's gonna happen. In other words, initially I was trying to simulate exactly what they, they did and I couldn't, I couldn't prove it not possible. So I went from this idea that they're talking about, which was a, uh, I, I guess, basically, uh, they, they, I think they were calling it, uh, in, in my case, uh, uh, basically my system, I called it a global collapse, not a, uh, what, what was the word they were using? A partial, a, a, a progressive they, collapse? Progressive, there's a word I was looking for. They call it a progressive collapse. We played that game too, couldn't make it happen. It was definitely a global collapse. We spent about six months playing around with the idea of what a progressive collapse could do. And every single time a progressive collapse called the build, caused the building to tilt. So that's not what happened. What happened was global collapse. <clears throat> about eight stories of all the columns coming out at one time within within a few seconds actually giving you gravity gravity basically a free fall condition there was a lot of there was a lot of discussion about the penthouse and why what what happened with that penthouse and 
huge amount of discussion I found quite interesting because everybody in the world wanted to know what the heck happened with that penthouse. So we, we began to study that within that year after we had come up with all the theory and examined. We, look, we looked at every connection. We looked at everything that we could look at. One, before I get into that detail, the other thing that we found out, that, um, which is really surprising to me, is the NIST study involved taking part of the structure. If you look down on top floor, they had outlined a section on the east side that they basically simulated the, the, the connections. In other words, the connection of the of the beam to the to the girder and the girder to the concrete uh, to the steel columns, and they simulated that as if they were uh, simulating the actual connections that were in the field that was built that way. Surprisingly enough, though, the other half of that building, the left side, the western side, they they chose to cr treat them as pin or fixed. Totally different phenomena. And so when- What was the term you used? Did you say pan or fixed or just that they were fixed? Pin, pin like a, a pen, pencil, but it was pin, it, it's pinned. In other words, it doesn't have any resisting moment or rotational resistance at that spot. It gives you, uh, it's held vertically, horizontally from moving but rotationally, there's nothing there. That's what's called a pin connection. They also had a fixed connections in there in which it had all restraints resisting it. Now, when, when you look at their collapse, you will see that that one side of that structure is behaving differently than the other side. No big surprise there. So, so that, that in itself was quite interesting. So, but we, through our study, made all uh, accommodate all the connections so that we sit, could simulate the structure as it truly was there we we also did some other things the concrete slab was actually on a pre uh, uh, it was on a on a what's called a steel um, stay in place forms and that set of steel stay in place forms was stiffer in one direction than the other. Imagine that uh, you had a little cup in one direction and the other direction, it was the sidewalls of that cup. So the concrete was more concrete in one direction than the other. And we simulated that as well. The other thing that we did that they didn't account for is that we looked at the fact that the, um, the I, I guess you would call the uh, the uh, the uh, what am I thinking about here? Uh, I'm looking at the expansion of the of the concrete in, in, in versus the expansion of the steel. The steel expansion had a much higher thermal conductivity than did that of the concrete, and the concrete. Uh, thermal properties are based upon the aggregate, the cement, the water, all those things. And in order to account for that correctly, uh, you need to know the kind of aggregate and the amount of aggregate that went into the concrete mix. I couldn't completely verify that, but I, I determined that probably a dolomite was probably the aggregate that was there. It was the most frequent in that area. Uh, and that's the best I was able to do. To, to account and, and show that the two materials behave differently under temperature change. Hmm. And so that means that uh, we were trying to, we were accounting for how that structure was put together and how it would respond under a fire condition, which is heating up that floor, heating up the walls, heating up whatever, okay? So within all of that, we, we began to study uh, we spent a lot of time trying to simulate what NIST did, and we couldn't simulate it. Then we decided, okay, we're, let's examine the system as if it was there and, and determine what we can learn from, and, and can we actually simulate what, uh, what happened on that afternoon? 
And so through that process, we ended up um, looking at the floor system without concrete, the floor system with concrete, with partially with concrete. So we, we simulated all those possibility conditions, uh, yet we knew that the concrete and the floor system were acting together. But I wanted to be able to eliminate the arguments that people would bring forth and show them that here's here's the behavior of this system. And, and then uh, we also looked at, okay, so they were saying, um, there was um, stuff that that Im impacted the lower columns from the uh, from the uh, twin towers collapsing and sent uh, particles and and uh, stuff into the columns and therefore destroyed its ability to carry load. We looked at that, not that significant, not not that big an issue. Granted, the fires came in because of that in, in the lower levels from eight to thirteen thereabouts. Um, so when we began to study the failure over that one year period, we looked at what what needed to happen in order to get uh, the collapse as we saw it on the video. What really what really transpired? It became very obvious that eight, eight floors were going to come out at the same time. In, interior columns were about two seconds sooner than the exterior, but the exterior didn't collapse inward. They came down just like the ex interior columns came down. Hmm. Uh, the other thing that we noticed is that the penthouse, uh, you know, came down first. And that's true when you look at them and that really got everybody excited for, it, it was amazing how excited everybody was about that penthouse. Well, we, we looked at that a lot of possibilities around that penthouse coming down earlier. And and it, it wasn't it wasn't the column seventy nine issue. It was a fact that, that that system uh collapsed in the in the top forty top forty five stories. Forty five stories between forty five and forty seven stories. That's it was a forty seven story building. It collapsed up there. Guess what? There was no fire up there. So they couldn't use the argument that that was a fire. They brought that thing down, the penthouse, which came down. I can't remember. It's a, a, a couple seconds earlier than the rest of it, mm -hmm. you know. So, so, and so then uh, we began to look at uh, free fall and what what was going on over the, the the level of the building. And if you take a look at uh, the work that we did, we we pl uh, plotted it to the same plot that a physicist. Uh, did and and it shows that it was free fall and our not our uh, line was almost directly on top of the free fall condition. So that's a, that's kind of a summary of wh where we were. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, arguments uh, from people that uh, said, "Look, uh, you you guys don't know what you're doing." Da 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 da. And I I got this gentleman from Germany who was really complaining about this and he was wanting to, the university to not publish it and all kinds of things and i said hey this is great why don't you tell me what what your staff is tell me about your engineers he said i i, I don't have i'm not an engineer what 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 are you well I'm, i have a business degree and and i'm also i do media really so why don't you grab a, num a number of people and put them on board and, and we'll have a discussion. We'll have an interaction. Oh, no. He never did contact me again. Hmm. So, and he tried to get our president fired and all kinds of stuff. So, so there, there's there been activity out there trying to put a quietness to, to the work I did. For those of you that are listening that are not architects and engineers and you haven't uh, had an opportunity to look into this, which I think the American people should have the right to see what has been told to them and the fact that it's not accurate. And, and so should practicing engineers and architects. I mean, it's absolutely imperative that we design and build things that's not going to hurt people. That's the whole idea, to protect the public. That's our that's our responsibility. So at the end of the day, I think it's important that 
the American people know about this. And if you haven't heard, there is, uh, uh, you, have, you have the opportunity on the University of Alaska Fairbanks website, and I believe also a 911 Truth has it, has my report. If you want to read the report, granted it's, it's a bit technical, but it's there for you to read, and I welcome you to read it. Uh, and besides that, I think some of my presentations are probably there. I know they are at UAF, the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And one more thing, uh, with, with that all being said, there's a movie called Seven. And it's amazing how much, how many people have seen that. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you take a look at it. And, and Andy, maybe you can elaborate on some of that stuff that I'm bringing out on how they can find information and, and maybe what we're doing on Friday uh, and how that will help the people have access. Yeah, that's right. The movie seven, it's actually the easiest way to find it is on Amazon prime. I know somebody who owns it off of that site and I know the people who made it a lot of hard work uh, goes into making these films. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than we anticipate, but it's because we're trying to do quality work and have a record out there on the internet, but not just the internet, on the internet, but also in people's home libraries of what is of what people have done, the findings that people have come to, something that lays it out in somewhat of an entertaining way for the people at home who may not be interested in engineering, but they're interested in this issue because it was 9-11. All that stuff is available out there, <clears throat> and you can also watch it, I believe, on YouTube uh, 7 but a great film and uh, you know, sort of a, I, I believe Dylan Avery's come back to the nine 11 issue after a time away from it. I think that was the first one uh, that he had done in a while on this topic. Um, but a lot of great science there. And you're talking about the efforts that people are having to try to diminish the report, try to attack it. There are things going on all the time, trying to go after AE nine eleven truth trying to undermine people there. Sometimes the problem can be right under your nose for the longest time. You don't see it, but you deal with it and you move on. And as for as long as I am here, we're going to keep on moving forward and promoting the Halsey report, the university of Alaska report and doing everything we can to keep the information. The AE nine eleven truth brings out flowing out to the supporters free of obstruction free of any kind of that nonsense we deal with it so that you don't have to um so it doesn't surprise me what you're saying and you know they, they want to attack the report the input data and all that stuff is available for people to get i mean in, in the beginning all the debunkers and stuff they had problems downloading it because it was so much information that it was compacted on there. And I don't understand how all that works with zip files and whatnot. We have smarter people than me on those subjects to figure that out. But there was so much information that they were having trouble downloading it at first. We figured it out so they could get it. But that goes to show you how transparent all of this is. Whereas in NIST, the NIST report, they want to protect it. They don't want you to check their work. They hide behind this 2002 National Safety Team Act. says they don't have to give us anything. It'll jeopardize public safety. If we do that, of course, we know that doesn't make sense. I've been beating that drum for years. You know what gets me, Dr. Halsey? And I was going to ask you about this, had planned it, is the fact that you do computer models. You know, you should try to make it look like what happened in real life. And as AE 911 Truth has famously pointed out, NIST computer animation, it doesn't even go through the full collapse. But after you go past collapse initiation and before it stops, the building starts to turn on itself in NIST computer animation, not the straight down symmetrical fashion that you see in real life, but you can do a side-by-side -side comparison and see that it doesn't match. Um, you know, it just amazes me. How did they get away with that? Like, can you, can you properly model a building and please illuminate me because maybe you can in some cases, but can you properly model a building and call it an accurate representation? If your model isn't replicating what's been captured on video by a bunch of different news stations on a, during a historical event. Well, first of all, let's tell you the model is not correct. Otherwise it would have given you the end, the same result. So that yes, it was not correct. And, and we, one of the points that I brought up to you 
there was two points that I brought up. Number one is the exterior walls were not stiff like they, uh, they said they were overly stiff. Not true. So I'm not sure just how much they relied on that in their three-dimensional model to simulate the failure. Okay. But remember, I told you about the interior uh, of the building and that the half of the building was modeled with the connections as if it was built that way. And the other half was built the other way. And if you look at the failure that they've got, you'll see that the half of that building is behaving differently than the other half. Hmm. So that, that right away tells you that they didn't handle that correctly. So, so the way you, you actually model one of these things, if you're doing it well, and I didn't tell you, I said, we're going to have quality control. I used two programs. Abacus was one program, one student. Both students used it, but one student would do Abacus. The other student used SAP 2000, which is out of California. It's well known. And it, it, uh, so I wanted to find out by two students, two different programs, if we could get close to the right answers or the answers where we're getting the same answers. Let's put it that way. So the way that works is this. First thing we did is we put the entire building in AutoCAD. AutoCAD is basically a drawing tool that enables you to simulate piece by piece everything that was put in that building that we could get our hands on. Now, granted, there's some issues here to, to remind the public about. Keep in mind that that building went down and they carried it all away, transported away all of the debris was gone in days. And what what do you do when you have a collapse? You go and you go through that and restore it and look at <clears throat> as a as an engineer, you need to understand what caused that failure. They transported everything away. We didn't have an option. We had we had to rely on simulating the building the best you could. So I used, to, I used AutoCAD to simulate the entire 47 stories. Then we could take that and break that out and into, break it up into little pieces called finite pieces. And that's where the finite element issue comes out. And so two, both programs had finite element capability. That means that we would break it up into these little pieces like a, like a jigsaw puzzle. Like if you, and you put those pieces all back together to, and, and now you've got what was, you started with. That's what we were doing. We were putting it together, breaking it up into lots and lots and lots and lots of little pieces. And if you look at my presentations or you look at my report, you'll see, oh my goodness, how many little pieces that was broken into. And that, and when we, when you mentioned that we provided <clears throat> this, this report was peer reviewed. Uh, by people other than AE 9-11 truth people. And it was reviewed by the, we, we let, what was it? Two or three months out there that we let, let people review it and provide comments. And we would then respond to those comments before we ever finalized the final report. We wanted to give people the opportunity to, to, to look and challenge the work that we did. And to this day, I don't have a problem with them wanting to challenge. If we want to have a discussion, I'm happy to have the discussion. We know that what we did was scientifically based, substantiated by results. And, and the other thing that we did that I didn't tell you is that at the end of the, near the end of that year, where we were trying to evaluate how well our model simulated what actually occurred, we said, okay, let's look at progressive collapse. Progressive collapse is actually where we started because everybody's talking about progressive collapse. So we took out column 79, the way everybody, NIST said, and then, uh, and then we looked at it, it didn't fail. And now, now we're doing it statically. We're not doing it dynamically. One could say, okay, why didn't you do it dynamically? We did do a lot dynamic. 
but to, to do this progressive collapse, we take out a column. Uh, so we took out column 79 to see what happened. Then we took out an additional column and we, we went through that whole process. And every single time we got a building that was actually tilting, which was telling us, okay, it didn't fail this way. This is not what happened out there. Then we went to the next set of steps. Okay, what what did what had to happen to give us the video that we see? And it became very clear it was global collapse. And the global collapse was all of the columns over eight stories. And then there, uh, basically the exterior columns of 2.5 seconds or that around that afterwards, they came down. And so at, at, at the end of the day, it, it w went into free fall uh, for a significant amount of time. And if you take a look at my model and compare it with the model, with the, with the actual structure, and you put those two side by side in video, you will see our model looks almost identical to the failure that actually occurred. Okay, now let me let me say okay i'm going to turn it over to you for a moment and i kind of gave you an idea of what what i went through well yeah i mean it's very thorough and i i remember sitting through your presentation in berkeley i might have missed the beginning of it because of uh you know stuff i had to do for ae at the time but um but i remember catching that and seeing the animation of that building coming down your animation it looked exactly like what we saw in real life. And again, it's just the, all the columns with internal columns within eight on eight stories of this building. You know, it's so interesting. I know you're not uh, involved in controlled demolition industry and all of that, but because people will say, oh my God, you would have needed this much explosive just to bring this building down. And if you're talking about eight stories out of 47, that kind of minimizes the cost. It minimizes the amount of, uh, of incendiaries that you got to get into this building so you know it's not an it's not like you have to obliterate the entire thing all you need to do is get at the the the, the key infrastructure of the building and all the rest of it will follow uh, and it sounds like you did that virtually uh in your animation and i guess i want to know too and i want you to get to the point you wanted to address in just a moment but also you know if you don't go past the point of collapse initiation like if you're nist is there any point in doing it at all like if you don't go through the entire building's fall, because that is what is at the center of the controversy here. Yeah, the collapse initiation is very interesting too, but I mean, what can you really glean from this analysis of NIST if you don't simulate the entire fall of the building? I'd like your, your knowledge and your uh, insight on that question. Well, there's, there's, so, there's so many things to to question NIST with, unfortunately. I mean, it just seems like, I don't think they, it, it just seems like they wouldn't have been, they have a really good reputation. I just don't understand what the heck they were thinking because there was nothing right about anything they did on this, on this uh, attempt to try to explain what may have occurred. And it took them forever to come up with this piece of sloppy information, you know, which they're asking people to believe, and there's just no reason to to accept it because it doesn't meet any of the any of the natural phenomena that goes on. And you know, I'm not, when I took on this, I I told the A911 people that I will I will tell you what didn't happen. I will not necessarily tell you what did happen. So that's the report that I put out there that this is this these are the conditions. So um, and I did that for several reasons. Um, you know, you hear hear people saying, OK, it, it was controlled demolition. It's got to be controlled demolition. You never heard me say that. Uh, but I have said this is what the columns had to experience. Now, if that being said, you as a person can probably say, okay, what, what may have created that, you know, and, and, and there's, there's a lot of things to talk about on that level. So anyway, um, that's, that's where I've been with that. And I continue to be with that at the end of the day, 
uh, and I, I haven't said this before publicly, but my purpose right now is not just to get the word out to the engineers and architects, which are, which is essential, but to the rest of the people, for God's sake. If the American people say, wait a minute, we're being lied to again. Don't you think that that, that will put the pressure at a higher level if you've got all the American people coming down and saying, oh, this is, this is, this is not something that we're willing to accept. It has to put pressure on at a level that we don't see right now. Because every, t every place AE 911 Truth turns, they're getting criticized inappropriately for something they shouldn't be. Because they're, they're there to try to provide public safety to the American people. That's why this organization is there. You got to stop and think about that if you're going to be putting out false information and asking people to design by it and expecting people to die from it, this is not appropriate. Well, yeah, we've been getting attacked for years. I mean, I don't even pay attention to it anymore, except when I sort of have to, if it's a big name out there. Um, but if you're getting attacked or you're having your work attacked or criticized unfairly, to me, it's just a signal that you're doing something right. It means that you are right over the target. You are on their radar now. You are a threat and you need to be dealt with if you're you know, having your reputation attacked, all of that. Um, so consider it a mark of, of, uh, success there that we have people trying to unjustly come after your research, even if their own, uh, even if their own arguments have no basis in reality. So we just need to take that momentum and, and take all of that, uh, uh information and somehow get it out to the American public and the engineering community, which we're working on with project due diligence, but also out to the people who are in our, sh our shopping markets, uh, who are out there uh, in the bars and just your regular average American, get them to understand this in a very basic way and understand why this is such a big deal. I think building seven just through the nature of its fall itself does that for a lot of people. I think to just watching that fall, you know, fire can't do that to the building, even if you don't have a, a grasp of the engineering concepts behind it, you just know that it isn't right. So we need to get this information out, uh, you know, the University of Alaska study, all the research of AE 911 Truth, in all the different ways that we can. We have tried in various different mediums. But of course, the engineering community as well. Uh, we're constantly sending out our volunteer engineers to go speak to the branches of ASCE, other engineering organizations. And whenever they do a presentation, I mean, they wake up at least 20 people. Um, how Well, I want to get your thoughts on how important the engineering profession is in this entire debate. And also what, what pressures are, are there on engineers, but also engineering professors who are still in the middle of their career or at the beginning of it, to stay away from this issue? Like, what if they started talking about your study in their classes, having people write their reports on it and all of those things? What could they expect? You know, I'm, I'm not sure that I can uh, answer that very well. And I'll, I'll tell you why. <clears throat> when I took on this project, uh, I invited some students to work with me. And I thought that you know, as as graduate students or undergraduates, they could they could learn a lot and they could really have some fun. I had a lot of students say, "Yeah, let let's do this," but they were married, so that all of a sudden, because of they were raising a family and they were doing this and they were doing that, they became concerned. Nothing that I did, nothing that anybody said, but but the word, the concern by students were, oh my goodness, I can't I can't put my family at risk. Now why would they say that? I found that interesting that they were already saying this before anything had been done. So the American people already, to some degree, 
were concerned that they weren't being told what had gone on. So you take that idea and all of a sudden the ASCE, of course I was, <laughs> I had conflict of interest here, quite frankly, I guess. Uh, I was the faculty advisor to the ASCE student chapter. Hmm. ASCE student chapter went after all kinds of speakers because they wanted to find out what was going on in the real world out there. And, and they, I didn't ever ask them to, in, uh, who to invite. I, I refused to participate in that game because we were teaching them to become professionals. And we I wanted them to invite to, to what they wanted to know, not what I thought the faculty should know. And so the, my students, invited me to make a presentation and I did as to what we were doing. Uh, keep in mind, I still, I, I had the two PhD students and they were from China. Now the a local chapter of ASCE, highly unusual, you would might say, because trying to get through uh, project due diligence, trying to get people to, organizations to uh, ask for a speaker on this subject is a challenge. Not there. They asked me to come and um, make a presentation. The professional uh, society asked me to do that. The, the uh, organization for contractors, Association of General Contractors, asked me to make a presentation. When we started having questions about trying to get project due diligence uh, presented to local chapters and, and we started getting, particularly to the Structural Engineering Association, for God's sake, you would think every structural engineer in the entire world would want to know that. <clears throat> Didn't seem to be a problem about the structural engineers. It seemed to be a problem of the president of the Structural Engineering Association was having issues. <clears throat> so I, I approached Anchorage with the idea of the Structural Engineering Association, contacted some of my former students in the city. I thought they might want to know about this. Got turned down hmm. by the president of that organization. I told myself, you know, I'm not done with these people yet. So this year I approached Scott Hamill, who is the who is the um, department chair of the civil engineering department. He and I are friends and he thought it was a great idea. And I thought it would be a great idea to get the word out to the faculty, the students and to, to the practicing professionals in the, in the community. And that's where we're heading on the 20th. So, and, and, and the university is so excited. I get they're so excited. They want to get this information out to the world. Don't you get that feeling, Andrew? I mean, you've spoken to him. To I the talked to the lady, the, the publicity lady. She's very nice, and they seem very enthusiastic. So that's what gives me a sign of hope here. And, and what we've found for, through Project Due Diligence is that the membership is interested in this, but then there's somebody at the top steps in somewhere and puts the kibosh on having a presentation. So it's like there's certain gatekeepers that are – you know, don't want this being discussed within chapters, but the membership does, and they're very interested. I actually call people, and they'll say they're, you know, they have heard of this. They they agree with us on it. They can't sign the petition for one reason or another that they're concerned about. So it's the engineering community wants to talk about this, but the organizations and sort of the quote leadership wants to keep this stifled. And sir, uh, we are out of time on this show. I could talk to you, keep on talking to you, but we're <laughs> going to be watching you here uh, at the University of Alaska Anchorage's website. Folks, I'll say it again. Sign up for our emails. They don't want this organization to exist. When I say they, you know, the, the gatekeepers, the people who want this issue to die, they want us to cease to function anymore so you got to sign up for our emails that's the way we get this information these interviews our news articles everything right into your inbox and stay in touch with you and uh, you're going to be getting an email from us 
uh, with a link to Dr. Halsey's presentation at the University of Alaska Anchorage Friday. Watch it. Dr. Halsey, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with our audience today and good luck on Friday. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.